My name is Joe Roman. I'm here with the Greater Cleveland Partnership. I want to welcome you all to our fourth quarter middle market forum. Uh, we have been using this uh, model of bringing in top middle market CEOs from our region to meet with you and you've been responding to us that it's been very, very helpful and interesting and we're going to try to continue it um, as we go move forward into 2018. So thank you all for being here. It's a, despite the camera in the back, trust us, it's a very open, candid forum. We're simply going to use some of that tape to make sure that other middle market folks that couldn't be here today can see snippets of the program because Stuart's worth it. Um, and we will have a great chance to edit it all so we won't use any of it that in any way, shape, or form shouldn't go beyond this room. So uh, we've done that before and we'll do it again. And again, people respond pretty well to that. Before we go any farther though, I do want to thank our sponsors um, because without them and without their engagement with so many of you in the middle market, these kinds of forms just wouldn't be possible. So I want to thank Medical Mutual. I think we have someone here from Medical Mutual or someone's uh, name tag out there will be picked up by someone from Medical Mutual. Minutemen HR, I want to thank them. Uh, PNC Bank, uh, Cuyahoga Community College's Corporate College, something, a facility that all of us use a lot. And our newest middle market sponsor, Great Lakes Publishing, Cleveland Magazine. Lute, thank you for becoming our, our newest sponsor. Um, so in addition to the uh, video that I mentioned, you'll probably also see some snippets or some quotes or some feedback about this program also in Cleveland Magazine uh, in upcoming issues because again we want to continue to to get this kind of great programming out to your colleagues. So why don't we get started because we I have so many questions I would like to ask Stuart that I know I'm not going to get a chance to ask him so I want to make sure we get as much time as possible and save some time for your questions because I think that's important. So rather than have me introduce Stuart, I think most of you know him, I'd kind of like him to introduce himself, but at the same time, introduce Riverside. Sure. I think most of the audience knows about Riverside, but maybe not all the details. Sure, thank, thank you, Joy, and thanks to you and to Steve and to the Weird Cleveland Partnership for this opportunity, and great to be with, with so many folks interested in the middle market, as has Riverside been. <clears throat> for our 30, almost 30 years, next year we'll celebrate our 30th birthday of, of existence. Uh, Riverside is a private equity firm. I'm, I'm guessing today most of you know what that means. Um, <coughs> truly 10 or 15 years ago, many folks didn't. And if you sure. have questions about it, we'll explore more today what that means. But um, private equity has become important uh, nationally. It's become important here in Cleveland. Maybe we can chat a little bit about that as well. Uh, and uh, we're, we're a part of that uh, phenomenon. Uh, as a private equity firm, uh, put simply, what, what uh, Riverside uh, does is to help uh, entrepreneurs, uh, uh, companies, and, uh, the, and their founders to achieve their objectives. Um, ideally, their objectives are to, to grow the comp their companies, to make their companies bigger and stronger. Uh, and uh, we pr do that provide by providing capital, both financial and intellectual capital. Uh, in many ways, folks tend to focus on the former, um, but I'm uh, and my colleagues are, are much more focused on the latter, uh, how we help these companies to grow. And we do that in a wide variety of ways. Once upon a time, um, uh, private equity was, was kind of limited to uh, taking control positions in companies. Uh, today, the Riverside Company does both control and non-control investing, and we do both um, equity and debt. So we can provide a, a wide variety of solutions. And once upon a time, private equity was mostly thought of in terms of what I would describe as more basic companies, manufacturing, distribution type companies, which are great. We love them. We, we've invested in many of them, about 140 in our history. Uh, but today we do much more than that. So whether you're a, a, a services businesses, whether you're a software business, a healthcare business, a franchisor, an education and training company, um, Riverside is, is there to provide uh, that capital. So you are different in many ways. We are. You are very different. So um, he, he very uh, creatively avoided himself in that whole thing. Did you notice that? So I'm not going to let you do that. Talk a little bit about your background. Uh, everybody, I think, knows Oberlin College. But from there, how did you get to where you are today? Sure. Um, 
So I, I uh, grew up in New Jersey, uh, went to Oberlin College and graduating in 1977, uh, left uh, Cleveland thinking uh, I would never live in Cleveland again. And that, that, my perception is that was kind of our nadir. That was when the, the river caught fire. That's when we were uh, dubbed the stake on the lake. Um, and uh, that's when uh, Mayor Perk um, uh, didn't go to the, uh, yes. to the uh, state dinner uh, for the People's Republic of China because it was bowling, bowling night. night. Um, <laughs> his wife's falling night. <laughs> but his, his average had fallen down, so he was trying to get it back up. I got it. it. So. Um, uh, I went off to Ann Arbor, Michigan and Washington, D.C. for 10 years. And in 1987, uh, I was offered an opportunity to return to Cleveland to, to, to do what I essentially do today, but for Citicorp, uh, for an entity of Citicorp um, uh, that had an office here in, in Cleveland. Uh, my wife Don and I came and looked around and um, uh, saw the kind of revitalization that was uh, occurring downtown. That was when uh, we were uh, raising the district to, uh, to build Gateway. Uh, that's when the flats, the, the old flats, was, was still kind of hopping. Uh, we realized uh, that we, we stayed at the old Stouffer's Hotel and uh, thoroughly enjoyed the experience and realized that downtown was coming back. And then what we really realized uh, was what I never understood when I was at Oberlin for four years which is putting aside all of that drama, what's always been true in Cleveland is it's an incredible place to live, it's an incredible place to work, incredible place to raise a family, and incredible place to build a business. Mm -hmm. So we bought a home in Shaker Heights, and now in our second home in Shaker Heights over the 30 years we've been here since then, and, and it's um, lived up to every expectation in terms of being a great place to raise a family and, uh, and to build a business. Uh, after five years at Citicorp, for reasons we can explore, um, I uh, left and had the opportunity to partner with a fellow uh, New Jerseyan, a fellow uh, Oberlin graduate named Bela Sigethy. Uh, I often use the term we at Riverside. Sometimes I'm talking about the 250 Riversiders around the world, but often I'm talking about myself and Bela because we've had this very unique 50-50 partnership uh, running, uh, owning and running Riverside. Yeah, that is very different. We're going to talk about that. Um, you know, I did notice you're from New Jersey. Everybody here today that Bruce Springsteen's house just went up for sale in New Jersey where he grew up, so you might want to go back and see if you can add that to your portfolio. I, I'm, a, I'm a very big fan of the boss, I know. As you so, know. Um, a lot of people here, obviously, um, are growing their companies as well. So as you look at middle market firms, try to assess their value, those kinds of things. What jumps out at you as some of the top three or four things that you need to know right off the bat as you assess a company? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the number one thing often surprises folks. Uh, and if you were to sit in on, on in one of our investment committees, you, you'd hear a lot of discussion of this. It's the um, <clears throat> efficacy uh, of the product. And that word has a lot of different meanings, but um, uh, we're, we're joined by Jason Thorne uh, here, who, who work, uh, works at Riverside, and uh, he uh, led the charge for us to acquire a company not long ago called Lily Baby. And if any of you or, or your um, family have had a child lately, you may have heard of this uh, particular brand, or certainly have heard of the product. It's a baby carrier. Uh, and. Um, uh, what sold us on Lily Baby was the uh, authenticity of the story, starting with its founder and why she created uh, a better baby carrier after she had back problems from the one that she used. Um, the the uh, truly uh, <coughs> better uh, uh, function of the product. Uh, it happens to be um, headquartered in Boulder, Colorado, which sort of contributes this whole sense of, uh, of authenticity. Not that we, you couldn't do the same in Cleveland. Uh, so, so that is the first thing we look at. Um, efficacy can extend to uh, thinking about the business from an environmental, social, and governance perspective as well, ESG. Um, so that, that's uh, important to us. If, if the product isn't, um, isn't effective, if it's, if it's a food that's not healthy or at least tastes better, uh, if it's not a baby carrier that, that works better, then uh, our view is um, we don't want to own it, partially because we're not going to be really proud to tell folks that we own it, and partially because it's probably not going to be a great investment over an extended period of time. Uh, the second thing is um, we need to see a growth opportunity. Uh, it's very hard for us to get our return. Once upon a time, there was a, a sense or 
possibly a myth that private equity you know, kind of made money by buying things cheap and then somehow breaking them up and selling the parts. I actually never understood how, how you do that. Maybe I'm just not smart enough. Uh, Riverside's uh, successful deals almost always have the same fundamental story, which is we bought a, a company that was a really good, smaller company. We made it a, a bigger and better company. And that starts with a market opportunity. It needs to have a growth opportunity. Uh, and then the third thing is we do need to have a, a management team. We're equipped well to deal with um, management teams that are imperfect. By, by the way, if you ever find a perfect <laughs> management team, let, let me know, because we're going to want to put that in the Smithsonian or something. That would be an incredible find. Um, management teams always are in the process of becoming uh, made more perfect, and, and we help that companies to achieve that. But we need to see the, the beginnings of that management team. We need to have something that we can uh, build on and, and work with the company. And then the fourth thing, I think you said mm -hmm. before, mm -hmm. um, is... Um, like five, if you'd like. Now, four, four, four covers the, the most important ones. Uh, would, would be um, specialness, uh, uniqueness, leadership in its niche. Uh, we, we're, even though these businesses are small, if you looked at the 80 plus businesses that we've invested in, we're currently invested in around the world, I, I, I hope in every case, I, in, in a very short period of time, I could convince you that it's a special company. Uh, Lily Baby, uh, the, the, I think the selling feature would be it's number three in its category in North America, and it's growing uh, considerably faster than its competitors uh, and growing um, uh, well north of double digit growth. Mm -hmm. Um, you've mentioned twice now, and I think you used the number even 250 people around the world, so you've got eyes in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. Describe a little bit, how do you find companies that you're interested in? How many, how much of it is proactive? How much of it is, you've got a great, I mean, obviously if I owned a middle market company, I'd rather come to you, someone who talks about growing, helping me grow than to tear me apart so that you can make a profit. So. Mm -hmm. People come to you, you reach out to people. Describe how that works. Sure, and, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, that, that people prefer the way we work because it, I think it does start with our brand. Mm -hmm. um, all of you with your companies are thinking about your brand every day. Uh, strangely, private equity firms maybe didn't think about their brand for years. Um, we started to a while ago, uh, almost two decades ago, and have tried to build a brand that is known for just what you're talking about, uh, Joe, and our, our original brand builder, chief brand builder is Graham Hearns, uh, who's sitting over here and continues to do that along with a lot, running a lot else at Riverside today. Um, but it's not enough just to be known. Um, we're, we're, we, you, you've got to be much more proactive than that. And uh, you talk about uh, folks with eyes, and uh, there's 16 of the 250 folks at Riverside who maybe have like a third eye in the middle of their forehead or something, and two of them are here today. Uh, Cheryl Strum in the back, and Matt Deli I saw over coffee. There he is, up front, always. Matt's always up front. Um, and uh, they're out there uh, uh, combing the market, uh, working through... These are your scouts, right? Absolutely. We call them originators. Uh, it's, uh, originators are, are very senior people at Riverside because it, the sales, no different than your business, is the sales function, if you will, at our businesses is terribly important, and they need to bring not just the ability to, to glad hand, if you will. As you know, once upon a time, that was, you know, that was the, the skill set of salespeople. Today, the skill set of salespeople is being technically proficient, it's, um, and, and our folks have to be extremely proficient. So, so people like, like Cheryl and, and Matt and their 14 colleagues are spread around the world, and they get up every morning and brush their teeth, I hope. <laughs> this morning, yes. And then they're, they're on the phone, they're on the computer, and in the car, they're in a plane. They're finding opportunities for us. Uh, in, in, in a year like last year or this year, they'll find well over 3,000 opportunities. Many of those won't fit quickly. Some of them will, will um, take quite a bit of investigation. And ultimately, that's what will lead us to a, a, a somewhere between the 40 or 50 deals we might do that year. Wow. 3,000 to 40 or 50. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing um, process. Um, so a lot of people out here looking to the future, and maybe they're not as close to selling their company as uh, you know they might think. Um, but it's always should be in the back of your head. So if, if you were advising people to always think about a couple of things they should be mindful of 
in terms of should they reach that day when they want to sell their company or reach out to a Riverside or talk to somebody else about what kinds of things would you suggest they pay attention to? Sure. Yeah. And, and by the way, if, if, if you never want to sell your company, um, just want to give it to Riverside, we'll be more than happy to take it. I, just, I had to mention that. And they go right to the 40 or 50 yeah. then, right? <laughs> right, exactly. You go to the top of the list. Um, you sh uh, I'm biased, obviously. I think you should be thinking about selling your company. I understand there's, sometimes there's, there's family, intergenerational, and other considerations. But, but I believe that it's, uh, odds are, for, for, for many of you, it's your most important asset and one, one you should be uh, thinking about all the time about how do I, how do I um, prepare for its future, which could be maximizing the value. There could be other objectives. Uh, and you could try to simultaneously s uh, solve for multiple objectives. It's not always a, a conflict between them. And I hope <coughs> you can explore that a little bit more. But, but the answer to your question is, um, it, to my mind, it always starts with objectives, knowing what your objective is. Um, uh, if, you know, do, you want, do you want to continue to work? Do you want to retire? Do you want uh, to make a generational transfer? Uh, to, do, you, do you want your son or daughter to run the company someday? Uh, really understanding what your, what your objectives are, I think, is, is always step one. And that may sound obvious to you, but you'd be amazed at how many sellers, quote unquote, mm -hmm. sellers we spend time with who um, haven't yet uh, thought that through. Uh, then the second thing is to make sure you're well advised. Uh, having the right lawyers, having the right uh, accountants, having the right tax advisors, having the right uh, financial advisors and investment bankers and the like can make a world of difference as you go through the, the process. It, it, isn't, uh, it isn't a simple process. Uh, I uh, am proud of the fact that the folks at Riverside try hard to make it easier uh, for, the, for our partners, for the sellers. And we do that partially because we think that's another way to differentiate ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, but we also do it because uh, if we're going to be the next investor or owner of this asset, the last thing we want to do is uh, damage it. And um, the, uh, just like if you went into a store and um, uh, wanted to buy a painting, and the next thing you do, you're, you know, you're, you're holding the picture and you're touching the picture and you're trying to uh, figure out how it's painted or made, uh, you may damage it. So our, our job is to try not to damage it. And these processes can take months, and they can do damage if, if not handled thoughtfully and carefully. Um, so, uh, so that's, uh, I think, an, an important principle. Uh, be well advised. And then be ready, um, which mostly means um, trying to make sure your financial house is in order. Um, many, pri many, many private firms underinvest. Uh, within the CFO function, they underinvest in their management information systems. We uh, deal with that on a regular basis and are very used to uh, m investing in those to make up for that. But, um, but it takes a certain amount of that to get through the sale process. So being ready uh, in that regard is important too. Yeah, talk a little bit more. So I'm intrigued by the objectives piece. So my guess is 3,000 to 50, you talk to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. My guess is you must, you must run into the company or the owner who says, I'm, I'm ready to sell, but after discussion, you realize their objectives weren't in the right direction. And maybe you even counsel them on, no, you're not ready to yeah. sell because it's really not what would maximize your objective at the moment. A absolutely, Joe. I, it, it's, it's so true. Also, I want to uh, say we should almost be uh, using the word sellers in quote, because if you think about how the typical private equity transaction uh, is, um, is uh, structured, uh, how most Riverside uh, transactions are structured. Um, sometimes we're buying 100% of the business. Uh, sometimes we're buying 80% uh, or 60%. Most often there is a significant what, what's called rollover from the prior owner into the new, new deal. And then, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning, uh, today Riverside is very actively doing uh, minority investing mm -hmm. uh, and uh, providing credit for growth. So um, what we're referring to as sellers often are, are not sellers. In fact, some of our favorite deals are with founders, with entrepreneurs uh, or their families who, um, who are, are anything but sellers. They're, they're as or more excited than ever about the growth opportunities of their business. Uh, they've committed their life to creating it, 
They may now have a financial advisor who, for, for very good and legitimate reasons, is telling uh, them that they have too high a percentage of their net worth in one illiquid asset, so you have to uh, diversify. Um, but they don't want to sell. In fact, maybe they want to buy a competitor. Maybe they want to build a plan overseas. Maybe they want to um, uh, clean up their capital structure because some of the early investors want out and they don't really uh, add value anymore. Um, we've seen everything you can imagine. And any of those objectives can be met through a private equity transaction. Uh, the key is, uh, to, is for, in the first instance, the quote unquote seller to understand what he or she wants to achieve. And then in the second instance for the private equity firm uh, to be um, flexible and, and clever, I'm not using that word pejoratively, in the best sense of the word, uh, to figure out how to uh, try to structure the transaction to, to maximize, to optimize. And again, you're, you're often doing that across multiple variables, uh, ownership, tax, uh, there's, you know, there's, there's uh, existing debt and, and things involved. I'm pretty passionate about all of this because um, that's how we make money. <laughs> so, and that's how we uh, help our 250 uh, employees to have good jobs and uh, to, to achieve their financial objectives. But I'm also passionate about it because when we help sellers, uh, quote unquote sellers, to achieve their objectives, it's uh, one of the most rewarding parts of our jobs. And it's typically not uh, limited to just the seller. To make this all work, they're going to uh, typically get their management teams involved. And we're going to, as I mentioned, work to professionalize those management teams. And part of that is going to be uh, aligning interests and giving the management team ownership so when these deals work, there's a kind of a cascading effect of success. There's a lot of beneficiaries of success. I saw Frank Porter here, yep. and even the Cadillac dealers uh, share in our success. <laughs> when people go out and, and buy their new car uh, as a result of the transaction, or they pay off a mortgage, or they put aside money for their, their child's education. Uh, we, we find all of that uh, incredibly uh, rewarding. And then if I can just stay on my soapbox for, for another it. minute or two. You know, I think it's very important for, for uh, communities uh, like Cleveland. I think it's very important for uh, countries like, like the United States, and we work globally. It, I, I've seen it work in a dozen or more countries. Uh, I think private equity is a real boon to the economy. Um, you will hear or read a lot about private equity that will make it sound like um, some kind of a get-rich scheme. And uh, having been in it for 30 years, I, I will assure you it is no get-rich scheme. But it is a pretty good, or can be a pretty good, um, get affluent or comfortable slowly scheme. Um, it, it really does work. Uh, and it works because when we get the alignment right, uh, and it flows down from our investors, who are our bosses, through Riverside, to the owners of these businesses who we work with, to the management teams of these businesses, sometimes even through the employee groups of these businesses. It's, it's enormous, enormously beneficial uh, to, a, to, to the community, to, to the country, to the economy. And one of the key uh, parts of it being so successful is that it rewards the entrepreneur for the incredible uh, risk and work they took to found the business, to grow the business. And, and, and any of you who have done this, and Lou, you, you've done this with Great Lakes Publishing, starting a business is, is, is really hard. Um, late nights, uh, scary nights, um, long days. Uh, and uh, if we don't have mechanisms where folks who start their business can ultimately get rewarded, if we don't have mechanisms to provide them the different types of capital they need along the way to the reward, um, folks are going to start fewer businesses. Uh, folks are going to grow fewer businesses. And you can look around the world and you can see in different countries the sort of different level of entrepreneurialism that occurs. And I think private equity has emerged as a, as a leading way to reward founders. Um, the public equity markets are still a way. They're still a very good way if you're a very big company. Um, that gets the atten real attention of the markets, or if you're a really small company but with a promise of something uh, unique or different, you know, something blockbuster like a technology business. A little overgeneralized, but if you're not on either end of those barbells, there's a good chance the public equity markets are not going to work well for you. And 
you, you can start to think about private equity as almost like the public equity market for private companies that don't fit the ends of the barbell. Okay, that makes sense. Um, as many people in this room know, for the last uh, nine to 12 months, <clears throat> our organization has been going through a strategic planning effort, and I don't think we've had any session in this room where the issue of talent didn't rise to the very top. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about how do you find the kind of people Riverside needs at each end of the barbell in terms of age continuum, experience continuum, and maybe even a little bit about how you think Cleveland is either um, performing in terms of being able to create that talent or underperforming and what we should think about. Sure, I'm, I'm Take glad. Take it wherever you want. Yeah, no, the no, talent I mean, is the I mean, main question. Right, right. We, could, we could talk all day right. about talent, and, and I'm glad that GCP is so focused on it. It, it is so important. Uh, and uh, I have to give a quick shout out to Riverside's partner, uh, uh, Mort Mandel and Parkwood. As you know, he's been on this yes. uh, for long before the rest of us, or, or I was. Uh, in fact, even wrote a book about it called All About Who, which mm -hmm. I would uh, strongly recommend to you. It's an it's a easy read, a fun read, and a memorable one. Um, so uh, I think the answer is that Cleveland has a terrific opportunity um, in this regard. Uh, I think our educational institutions, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit biased. I put Oberlin in that list, although I recognize mm -hmm. that it to you may not feel as closely aligned with Cleveland as I think it could or, or should be, but it attracts uh, folks from all over the world, like me at 17 in New Jersey, um, and uh, provides to them an extraordinary education. Too many of them then go everywhere else, and hopefully we'll, over time, keep more of them in Cleveland. Um, certainly, uh, institutions like, um, like Case, uh, like um, uh, uh, the Cleveland State University, and like Tri-C are very attached and doing a lot in these areas. And then we are kind of surrounded by these very interesting private colleges and universities like Baldwin Wallace and John Carroll and, and others that also feed it. Um, Ohio is a hotbed for education every way. So Boston has been enormously benefited by producing so much young talent and then mm -hmm. keeping it in Boston. And, and if we can do the same, we're gonna be hugely advantaged. Uh, what we have going for us in terms of keeping uh, uh, young talent is it's um, Cleveland is so darn affordable. Um, so our young folks that we attract to Cleveland, we're often attracting here, either returning here, uh, trailing spouses or folks coming home, or attracted here for the first time. They're coming from the coasts or Chicago, where the cost of living is, particularly housing, is three or four or five x what it is here. And here our folks, um, even our youngest folks. Uh, really live like queens and kings um, compared to their colleagues in these other cities. And I know that because our other US offices are in places like New York and San Francisco. Um, so I think that the affordability of, uh, and particularly of housing is a huge advantage that we have. Um, some folks would point to some negatives that we have. Uh, we're our own brand, and I know we're working hard on improving that, our, our weather and, and um, <laughs> climate change is unfortunately going to improve that. Um, but um, I, I don't personally think things like that are, are, uh, sh should stand in the way of us being able to attract young talent. Uh, last time I, I was to Minneapolis in September, it was, uh, there was a blizzard, uh, and Minneapolis seems to be doing just fine. Right. So I don't, I, don't think, I don't think we should look at degree days as being uh, the big impediment. It's jobs. It's the ability to offer young people great jobs. And, um, uh, we, when, we, when we have a, a job to fill at Riverside, I'm very impressed with the quality of talent that we can attract. And, and um, uh, if anything, we need to be uh, in, uh, increasing the labor pool here of talented folks. Um, a lot of great jobs are, are begging for more talent. So just creating more and more of these great jobs, more, more and more great career paths for people at the start of their career. You know, later in their career, um, we've also done very well attracting folks. Um, the, the famous old saw from Headhunters is the only thing harder than uh, attracting somebody to come to Cleveland for a new job is getting them to leave Cleveland yes. for their next yeah. job because of the quality of life that they can afford while they're here. Al along the way, we have to give folks great opportunities, great career advancement opportunities. We have to, um, uh, that, that means trying to keep uh, 
the whole ecosystem going, um, and um, larger companies with their headquarters here provide the best career advancement opportunities. And when we lose these large employers, it's uh, these large headquarters um, in mergers and acquisitions. Um, it, it, it sometimes has a lot of uh, terrible consequences, although it, my sense is that was true 10 or 20 years ago. We were on the, you know, we, famously we were the, the home to more Fortune 500 companies um, outside of New York, uh, other than, uh, except for the fact that they were all in the lower half of that, and they became targets. But today it seems more and more um, we're the, uh, almost a beneficiary of that, um, uh, uh, where, where our companies are making acquisitions. So I see, I see growth. I'm fundamentally more optimistic now about the progress in Cleveland than I've been in my 30 plus years of, of living in, in the region. Uh, I think we have, we have a lot going for us and um, we just need um, great policies and I know that's the work of, of the GCP. We need great government decisions uh, and we need all of us as employers to be investing in, in, in our people and in our businesses here. Are, um, are internships a part of your strategy on talent? Uh, they are. Uh, in, in any given year, we're going to have uh, globally somewhere around 30 uh, or more uh, interns. Uh, Cleveland is, I think, our single largest uh, venue for, for interns. In the course of year, we'll have at least 15, maybe more. Um, uh, so I think, I think it is. Um, uh, the folks that intern uh, with us uh, often end up working for mm -hmm. us, either immediately on graduation or sometimes later in their careers. Even if they don't, the connections that are forged are, are, are in a sense, uh, lifelong. Um, I'll, again, give a quick shout out to organizations uh, like um, uh, Summer on the Cuyahoga that do a mm -hmm. great job of attracting young people and uh, changing our brand, changing the image, changing their perception of uh, this as a place to live and work. So you're buying or investing in about a company a week. Mm -hmm. How do you stay, it's, that's intense. How do you stay engaged in that at that level all the time? Where do you go for advice <laughs> um, when you need it? Because we all need it. Yeah. So how, that's, a, that's a very intense company. I know you have a co CEO, yep. which should make it a little easier. A lot easier. But still, how do you how do you get up every week, knowing that that week you're going to buy another something? I hope so. Right. Yeah. Dis disappointed the weeks we don't. Um, for, first of all, again, 250 people, uh, 16 offices globally. The the 50 companies are a combination of platforms and add-ons right. to those platforms. Right. Um, uh, so it, 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 when when you drill all the way down, it's it's actually quite a quite a measured process, and we are very process-oriented at Riverside. If you were to, uh, again, attend one of our investment committee meetings that we call the Moms, the Meeting of the Minds, they occur through the days on Mondays, um, you would hear an awful lot of acronyms, or as we call them, a TLAs, three-letter abbreviations thrown out. <laughs> um, in fact, we have an LOA, a list of acronyms that we give folks when they join Riverside so they can follow it. Got it. Uh, it's a little quirky, uh, but it works for us. Uh, we're very process oriented and that's important to that. In terms of just maybe a little more personally, uh, how, do I, how do I stay fresh? First of all, I got the world's best job and I'm ruined for life. It's <laughs> barely a job. Uh, I, if, you're, if you're curious um, about uh, what makes the world work or what makes industries tick, um, is, I'm a corporate voyeur. I get to wander around and stare in the windows of companies and learn all sorts of things about them. So it's, it's incredibly stimulating. E literally every Monday, I'm gonna sit in these moms, uh, starting at 8 a.m. and ending, uh, depending on the Monday, somewhere between 7 and 8 p.m. I'll, I'll have gone around the world. We'll have talked about several hundred companies, some for 30 seconds and some for an hour. And I'll have learned so much. And my biggest takeaway over the 30 years I've been doing this is there are so many ways to make money. I mean, far more than any of us ever appreciated. And new ones are being created every day. And you've heard people talking about the impact of technology, and we're seeing it on every company and every industry. Uh, we're not technology investors, or I used to say we weren't, but today everybody's a technology investor because it's affecting everything. And people talk about the, the, what, the power of software, and we're experiencing that firsthand. And Cleveland quietly is, is uh, yep. creating a lot of great little software businesses that I hope someday will be big software businesses and will stay in Cleveland. I think we have a, a shot at that. 
uh, so the, the, it, all that is, is so refreshing. Um, I get to work with these amazing colleagues that keep me on my toes, challenge me every day. Uh, uh, we, we select our folks very much for a fit in culture. Maybe we can chat about that a little bit, time permitting, but uh, th that, that makes the work all the more rewarding uh, uh, because of them. Uh, I am an avid reader, um, or I should say skimmer. Um, I, I, I look at every picture, I read every caption, and I selectively read the text, but I'm, I'm getting a lot of the content. Uh, I do look at three, uh, uh, three newspapers a day, two national and, and, the, and the Plain Dealer. Uh, uh, I know it's a little old fashioned, but I, I take the train to work, uh, the, the Green Line, and I uh, can get through the Wall Street Journal on the, on the train ride, and that's, uh, it's, it's, it's digital on my mm -hmm. device, but it still feels great. Um, uh, so I think, I think whether reading not just newspapers, but, but industry, uh, uh, lo local uh, periodicals uh, like Lutz, um, uh, industry periodicals, obviously today with the web, there's so much to read, so much information. In fact, the problem today is not finding uh, sources, it's prioritizing, it's figuring out what's true and what's not. But it is, it is I think, given what I do, very important to to be aware of all that. And then, of course, I need to make sure I'm feeding my other dimensions, whether that's um, time with my uh, six grandchildren. I was with uh, them last night. It, it includes two twins um, at the age of 18 months, and that will keep you fresh. <laughs> um, um, shout out to my daughter, who has six children, three under the age of four. Uh, amazing. Obviously, she uh, is rebelling against having been an only child. Um, uh, uh, my cycling, I'm, a, I'm an avid uh, uh, cyclist. I mentioned Frank Porter. He's, he's even more avid than I am. Uh, and uh, that's a wonderful time to think and reflect. And, and there's a lot of talk about cycling being the new golf, and you can do it with other people, and you can talk. If you're aware and safe, you can talk while you ride. Uh, so that's, that's a treat. And, and if time permits, I would love to promote Velosano a little bit as a, as a cycling event. Um, so that's, that's important to me to, to keeping uh, fresh a, a, as well. Um, but I, again, I'm just, uh, I'm spoiled. So we've, we've teased everybody a little bit with this uh, co-CEO model. Mm -hmm. And very few people walk out of business school today believing that the model for running companies mm -hmm. is to have two CEOs. So you've made it work yeah. uh, over a long period of time. Um, Talk a little about how that works, and also you and Bella have also talked a lot about how you learn from mistakes. You've written about it. <coughs> See if you can combine those two sure, for us. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I, I think I've been enormously benefited from having this unique partnership uh, with Bela, spanning now literally uh, almost three decades. Um, <clears throat> given what we do for a living, uh, when you think about private equity, it's really all judgment. I mean, we're, what we're thinking about, um, which companies in which industries, uh, how much we should pay, who should run, and what should the strategy should be, when should we sell them. These are all just judgment questions. There's no right or wrong, obviously. I mean, ultimately there is. So the ability to have somebody where I'm perfectly aligned, where we talk about all these issues, sometimes endlessly, until uh, we come to some kind of agreement. Um, and generally we do. Uh, I don't think it's a consensus model. In fact, we have kind of an interesting little standard we use when, when we, we have talked about something over an extended period of time and still don't agree. We'll then uh, pivot and, and, and ask ourselves kind of who knows more about that subject or who cares more about that subject. And if it's something that he knows more about and cares more about, I'm probably going to go with his Maybe. answer, okay. logically. Um, so so I, I, I'm a huge believer, if you, if, there's no question in my mind that I'm happier, uh, I'm richer today because of having this partnership. And, and I believe if we were to ring up Bela now, he would say the same thing, which I think is really interesting because it would, that's only possible if you think the world is not zero sum. And at Riverside, uh, if you asked us, so what are some of our kind of most important cultural touch points? I think one of them is where populated by people who don't think the world is zero sum, who don't think that the only way I can get more is if you get less, who figure out, let's, um, let's not fight over the uh, percentage of the pie, let's bake a bigger pie together. Um, I think that's, that's a really been one of our key principles at Riverside, uh, along with uh, leaving great references in our wake. So um, 
So I think that uh, th all that supports the co-CEO model. I'm not advocating it for every company in every industry. I, I realize that 50-50 partnerships are fraught with risks and issues. A lot can go wrong along the way. We've been incredibly lucky both keeping our health and, and, and whatnot through it. Um, but in some circumstances, it, it, it really can work splendidly. And interestingly, for a variety of reasons, in private equity, it's more common than in um, just about any other field. In fact, the, if you look at some of the largest best-known private equity firms in the world, I'm referring to Carlyle, Blackstone, KKR, Apollo, um, they had, where well, they were founded by co-CEOs, or in the case of Carlyle, three, and they've now uh, dealt with the issue of succession and the success, the succession is with co-CEOs, okay. which I think is even more interesting mm -hmm. phenomenon. Mm -hmm. That is. Yeah. And a little bit about your, how you learn from mistakes. Mm. Thank you. I made a mistake and forgot to reference That's that. Okay. I was supposed to weave it in. Yeah, I mean, um, I think we all know this. Our, our, if we don't, our, our kids and our grandchildren will, will demonstrate it for us. We learn far more from our mistakes. I mean, it's, it's easy to... When things go well, you just, you're just not forced to do the level of introspection. It doesn't hurt in the same way. Um, so so uh, when we, uh, whenever we uh, exit a transaction, whenever we sell, we, we go and we uh, do a deep dive in introspection. But the ones where it doesn't work and tend to leave the most powerful lessons, and we uh, memorialize and something we call lessons from the loo, L-O-O, -O, the English word for bathroom. And at River, in, in Riverside offices around the world, there's a poster that has these lessons up on it. Um, so um, several times a day, in fact, for me, it seems to be an increasing number of times <laughs> each day, uh, I am uh, forced to uh, stare at these lessons uh, and be reminded of, of the mistakes that we've made. And um, uh, I've gotten to the point where I, I, I don't mind making mistakes. It, it, it's humbling. I still get it wrong after some time in, in, in the next few months we'll buy our 500th company. Um, and I still get it wrong. And, and I'm humbled by that, but I accept that. What, what I have much more trouble accepting is when I make the same mistake again. I, I want to find um, new and creative ways to be wrong, uh, <laughs> as long as the, uh, the old proven ways, uh, we, can, we, can, we can cure that. So that level of introspection, I think, uh, goes around, across the firm, around the world. It's, um, uh, last week we had our annual, two weeks ago, we had our annual investors conference uh, and stood up before all of our investors, 315 people, and had one of the sessions that we have every year called Lessons from the Losers, where we take these, okay. uh, one of these lessons from the loo from a recent loss and um, lay it out just as sure. clearly as we know how to our investors. And, you know, and, and God bless our investors because these are sophisticated people and you know, none of them have ever come up to me afterwards and said, you know, boy, wh wh you know, well, how stupid were you? What were you <laughs> thinking? They all say, thank you for your candor. We, you know, we know you make mistakes. We make mistakes. We, we just, we're really heartened to see that you actually are trying to get better. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. So I do want to save some time for some questions, but you know, I've known you for a long time and you've been, and as many have, you've been a great philanthropist in our town, uh, well known for your support in the arts and those kinds. And then all of a sudden, out comes this Velisano uh, activity. Describe sort of where that came from, how you've been involved, because it really is unique in terms of a CEO in our town really starting a whole program from the ground up. Mm -hmm. Uh, sure, and I remember well the call I made yes. to you very early, yep. uh, literally at, at the birth of it. Um, so so uh, like, like so many um, great things in America, it really is, is uh, uh, driven by plagiarism. Um, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a model that I came up with. For 16 years, um, uh, my wife Donna and I every uh, summer would load our bikes, including our tandem bike, on the back of our car and drive to... Massachusetts and riding something called the Pan Mass Challenge, which is a two-day, 200-mile bike ride to raise money for cancer research at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And every year we'd say the same thing, which is we love the event, we love the cause, well, why do we have to drive 12 hours to do this? So when I joined um, the Board of Trustees of the Cleveland Clinic, I was uh, delighted to find out there were some folks there who knew about the event, understood the potential of it, 
uh, and would be supportive if we could create something similar mm -hmm. here. So I reached out to some friends uh, around town like Joe and was, again, very uh, encouraged to find out that there were businesses that would join in this effort. And uh, uh, five years ago, we launched the effort. Uh, this past July was our fourth ride uh, in Velosano 4. We had 2,000 cyclists riding. Uh, collectively, we raised um, three, uh, 3, I'm sorry, $4,175,943. But who's counting? <laughs> Thank you. That's tremendous. Um, and that, that brings the four-year total to about $12.5 million. That money uh, is uh, being invested immediately. We're not building buildings or, or raising endowments, although I've, we've done lots of that, and that's important work, too. But, but we're, we're trying to find cures as quickly as, as humanly possible. The money's being spent here in Cleveland. It's going to doctors and scientists who come uh, to, with, with an idea that they want to test. Uh, 50, 100, dollars $150,000. We'll do the test. We'll fund it potentially for several years if needed. If the test is successful, they're going to generate the data that's needed, and that's about that thick, to apply for a government grant, NIH or the like, and the funding rate of that is about 11%. That then allows them to do uh, the big tests that might be required to, to come out with the blockbuster drugs or, or the new genomics or immunology or other approaches that are showing so much promise. But um, uh, the, the, the amount and quality of research, medical research, that's going on in Cleveland, all of us drive by those big buildings as we go down um, uh, Carnegie, and we have no idea what's going on inside of them. Some, some incredible work is going on inside of them. And, uh, and while uh, government money, the moonshot, um, uh, is, is, is obviously important, I think if you ask the, the folks around the country who are doing this work, the, the kind of nimble money that we're able to raise right. in private philanthropic efforts like this is more important. The discussion. Uh, and, yeah. is, is gonna, when, and, and when we cure cancer, and we're, we're finding cures, I know we get, every time we hear about another uh, uh, loved one, friend, uh, family who get, is ill, we, we're, we're angry, we're frustrated, we're, we're disappointed. Um, but the progress is, is tremendous. Um, and, 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 and this work is so important. And the great news is you don't have to ride 200 miles. You can ride 12 miles through the city of Cleveland, ending on a lap around Progressive Field, because Paul Dolan is one of our co-chairs, and, and, and God bless Paul, he's been amazing in this effort. Uh, there's no other city in the country where folks get a, a ride on mass around the warning track. The groundskeepers hate it, um, <laughs> and it's an amazing perspective. You can do it with uh, your own children as, as young as eight or nine years old on the back of your bike or with you, um, and have an incredible family experience. If you're, again, an avid cyclist like Frank is, you can have a, the, this 200-mile, two-day incredible experience, and you can be part of this community effort. We're all trying to, to, to join together. Uh, to, to uh, fight cancer. It's an inc incredibly fun, exciting weekend, 20 to 22 July. Um, uh, registration will open on December 4th. It really is amazing. So questions? We have time for a few. Stuart, what's the quirkiest Hold on one second. investment oh. you've made? So what's the quirkiest investment you've made in those 30 years or so? And what's the one investment that you hated to give up? Oh, because wow. I know they're always time limited. Yeah. Well. Well, great. Thanks, Brian. Uh, the 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 I'll do the one I hate to give up first. Um, and that uh, that is three examples of this. Actually, four examples of this now where we've actually reinvested, <laughs> uh, and we never should have sold. Uh, du Bois Chemicals in Sharonville, Ohio. Uh, uh, the Dwyer Group uh, out of Waco, Texas. Uh, I see the right. flyer, and we're going to be honoring the Dwyer Group on January 18th to raise money for, um, uh, for Values in Action. Pro some of you may know it as Project Love. And, and we've um, got some flyers on there. Flyers are, like are available. And, uh, and that's because the Dwyer Group is, is, is maybe the most principled uh, partner we've ever seen in terms of them applying their principles through their organization. And, um, and uh, at, at Riverside, we believe strongly that, that uh, better values drive better valuations, and the Dwyer Group is a great example of that. It's been, it's been incredibly successful. Uh, we've reinvented in a business called Momentum Textiles out of uh, Los Angeles, uh, and the uh, Health Safety Institute um, out of Eugene, Oregon. So each of those were, were fantastic companies, um, and uh, 
they, they grow and they grow. But I will cite a, another business which we haven't had the privilege of reinvesting in yet. Uh, I hope maybe someday we will call, called Nordco. Uh, Nordco makes the equipment that's used to maintain railroad tracks. Uh, and you may think of that as being kind of a cyclical business, except for railroad tracks need to be maintained almost regardless of how much they're used. And if you want to make more money owning a railroad like Warren Buffett does, um, fundamentally you need to have trains that uh, carry heavier loads and go faster. And um, the key to doing that is to maintaining the tracks better. So um, it turns out um, uh, investment in this increases. So when we, uh, we were the second private equity investor in Nordco, we partnered with Bruce Boskowitz um, and uh, uh, did four add-ons and, and tripled the size of the business and sold it for a great gain. The folks that bought, bought it from us, Omers, uh, uh, grew it more, sold it for another great gain. It's now owned by another private equity firm called Greenbrier. And when they sell it, they're gonna make a great gain. So that's all great, people are making money. Um, who cares? Well, the pension funds, the endowments for your colleges and universities and others who invest in private equity, they care. They're beneficiaries of these great gains. We're very proud to have Ohio Police and Fire as one mm -hmm. of our mm -hmm. uh, investors. And every time we have a great gain, I love sending them their distribution proceeds because it's helping our first responders have their, the retirement they deserve. Um, but the community cares too because this is a company that's located in Milwaukee. And every time I visit Milwaukee, um, Bruce is adding another a wing to the plant. He's hiring more employees. Um, it's become a, a, a major business in Milwaukee from very, what I would describe as very humble beginnings. <clears throat> so the whole community cares about it. So these are some great examples. In terms of the, of the quirkiest, we, we've, again, there are so many ways to make money uh, in America today. But I'm going to mention one because, because it's, just, it's, it's local and it's recent. Uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll mention how much time do we have? Two that are local and recent. All right, the first one is, uh, is N2Y, and it's located uh, just west of here in Huron, outside of Sandusky, Ohio. So um, uh, it was founded by um, Jackie Clark, along with her husband Dave and their children, uh, Chrissy and Mike and the son-in-law Don. But when, when, uh, when Jackie started it, she was a speech pathologist uh, teaching special education children. She started the business because she was so frustrated she couldn't find uh, good curriculum materials to use to teach them. So she would go home at night and she would literally cut and paste articles onto cardboard, uh, onto poster board to show the children. She wanted to use news as a way to teach um, children that had learning disabilities. Turns out they care what's happening in the world too. You just need to have a find a way to communicate it to them. N2Y stands for news to you. Okay. Um, ultimately, she. Uh, converted this into an online way of providing curriculum materials and thousands of special education teachers and, and now school districts around the country are using these materials. They invented along the way their own language called symbol sticks, which is a way to use pictures to communicate with um, children that are um, suffer from autism or learning disabilities. Credible uh, success story here in Ohio. Um, Jackie and Dave wanted to retire for Dave out of the Air Force. It was his second retirement. Um, wanted to sell the business, but wanted Chrissy and the uh, kids to stay involved. In fact, uh, was hoping that Chrissy could run it. Uh, we we uh, bought out um, Jackie and Dave. Chrissy and, and her husband, Don, are our partners. Um, we, she is the CEO of the business. Uh, we are providing her the, the, the mentorship and the support. This is that intellectual mm -hmm. capital mm -hmm. we started with to grow that business. Uh, we're, it's going to be a tremendous uh, success again under us. Um, uh, achieving everybody's objective, baking that bigger pie, win, 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 win for Jackie, for Chrissy, for Riverside, our investors, uh, the state, the community in the state of Ohio, et cetera. Uh, and, then, and then locally in town, um, a business called Shaker. Uh, some of you may have know, known it by its prior name, Shaker Consulting. But they're in a very interesting business, which is if you were going to hire a lot of people, and I, and I hope you might have that a need or opportunity someday, uh, you would want to have a higher success rate. To, uh, mishires, turnover in hiring is extremely expensive. And if you think about um, the big Amazon distribution facilities that are being built here, they're going to hire a lot of people. If you think about um, Starbucks, it's constantly opening stores. They, they hire a lot of people. CVS, um, every time they open a new pharmacy, they need to staff it. So for these types of recurring hirings, um, Shaker, which has 50 employees, 26 of whom are PhDs, goes in and develops a simulation that the employee applicant can take online and uh, it predicts with great accuracy who's gonna succeed at that job. 
wonderful Cleveland company um, uh, that, that we're convinced is ready for prime time. We think this thing can be uh, grown tremendously. The key to that is really helping them develop their sales function. Uh, 26 PhDs, um, but no uh, head of marketing. Got so it. we think it's a it. uh, tremendous, co tremendous company. We're very excited oh. to be investors in it. One in the back. Stuart, I have a, a comment and a question. First comment is uh, everybody here heard Stuart talk about the Dwyer Group receiving the award. He's a very humble man and a very successful. You're one of the most unselfish people, successful I've ever met, and I want to compliment you. But also at that award, Stuart failed to mention that he is getting an award <clears throat> and his company and his cohorts, Riverside. And it's a Values Matter Humanity Award on January 18th. I just want to say congratulations. I also have flyers back here for anybody who wants it. I'll be back here for it. And I want to congratulate you. And as I said before, you're very successful and a humble man, and you contribute tremendously. Thank you, Thank you for that. Now, my question, how do you deal with the proverbial umbilical cord attached to the person, the owner, uh, that, that you deal with that maybe doesn't want to cut that umbilical cord, does, is interested in what you're doing, but it obviously can turn out to be maybe the biggest obstacle for success. Yeah, you're exactly right. And you do have to, um, again, starts with objectives. And, and there's any number of sellers we've met with over the years where ultimately we and they concluded that there was not a fit mm -hmm. between their objectives and our objectives. But I want to be very careful to say that at Riverside, we recognize that some of the same traits that make um, founders successful in their companies, that willingness to take risk, that willingness to work harder, um, to persevere, the grit. Sometimes that comes with um, some other issues. Maybe they're a little more stubborn. Maybe they have a little sharper elbows. Maybe they have a little chip on their shoulder. Uh, I've been quoted as saying, um, uh, sometimes people uh, with chips on their shoulder and something to prove um, do that. They prove it. Um, so we, uh, we've successfully partnered with any number of them. I think the key to it is, is for everybody to be very clear about what we're doing and what the ground rules are, um, what, what's sort of inviolate and what's not. And um, I think as long as there's a, a, a clear understanding of that, as long as you're, you're very uh, uh, transparent, overused word today, about it, then I think we can still partner successfully with that individual. But if it's somebody who's, it, who's just, it's all about me, and um, it's not about anybody else in the company, and it's never going to be about anyone else, and it, this company's never going to be anything without me, uh, that's very self-limiting for them, and that uh, likely means that it's not going to work for us, and let's just be... It's the zero-sum part. Uh, yeah, right. They're, they're, right. They're not willing to bake that bigger pie. Thank right. you. Other question? Jose? Uh, you mentioned before about you go out and get, you go get advice when you don't know. Uh, when you're we're looking for some direction. I'm looking for some direction. You know, I, I really am interested in the Commission Economic Inclusion and the development of minority companies. And so what, what are the barriers there that you see? What, what advice could you give? And specifically, I'm interested in the development of Hispanic companies. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, uh, given demographics, uh, obviously, it, this should be a fast-growing part of our economy, and I think there's some beginnings and some evidence there that, that it is. There are uh, several private equity firms now that are focusing on investing in Hispanic companies, none of them in Cleveland today, uh, although I hope they, uh, some of them would be active here even if they're headquartered in Texas or California or other, or other locations. Um, so I think that um, more often than not, the impediments to uh, success or growth uh, among um, uh, minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, are the same uh, as faced by every other business. And then they face these additional challenges that come uh, given the nature of, of their ownership. Uh, I, I, I still believe that private equity can be a great partner for them uh, to help them overcome those challenges and succeed. Um, and uh, I know at Riverside, we would uh, be eager to do that. Uh, in terms of our own firm, I would give us um, 
good marks in terms of uh, achieving gender diversity within our own team uh, and achieving um, some uh, gender diversity among the management teams of the companies that we invest in. I would give us lower marks in terms of achieving as much diversity as we would like among the, uh, in, in, uh, in terms of minority ownership or other forms of diversity, although uh, something that we, we want to do a, a, better, a better job with. Um, but, but from, you know, I start, I could be naive, but I start from the perspective that private equity is a, is a very good um, uh, tool, partner, uh, for these businesses as well. I don't see any reason it can't be. Um, to, to attract it, they're going to have to do the same things or similar things to what any other business would do. Again, in the case of Riverside, um, we're going to want to see that efficacy of the product and, and sort of the authenticity. In fact, I could argue there they have an advantage um, if, if they're, uh, if, if they're going to try to sell to, um, uh, say, an Hispanic demographic, then being um, Hispanic owned and having that authenticity should be a competitive advantage that we would recognize as an investor. Then they're going to um, have to be a well run, well advised and, and do the same things uh, that any other business would, would do. And then um, they're going to have to have that, that, that start of the management team, but they certainly can and do. So I don't, I mean, maybe I'm naive, Jose, but I, but I don't see, um, I, I don't see uh, impediments to it. Time for one more quickie over here. Good morning. Um, you had said that management is one of the four things that you look at when you assess a company. What are the things that you're looking for when you're assessing the management team? And then what is it that you do to make them better? Yeah. So we're, we're looking for um, uh, a, a certain level of, of industry expertise for sure. We can complement and supplement it, and we do, both by hiring uh, other people that, out of the industry and importantly by putting on the boards of all of our companies two outside board directors who are typically chosen for being deep industry experts. Um, we're looking for uh, uh, their level of commitment to the business. Uh, Sometimes that's evidenced by longevity. Sometimes it's evidenced by their ownership or their willingness to invest even a modest, uh, absolute amount of money, but a meaningful amount for, in terms of relative to their net worth, that, that, that level of, of commitment. And then um, their desire to grow the business. We're going we're gonna to want uh, to make our returns. We're going to want to double or triple the size of the business over our five years. That typically means doing some add-on acquisitions as well as trying to supercharge organic growth, like by creating this marketing arm for, for the shaker business I referenced. Um, and, and they have to be all in. They have to want to uh, work that hard, um, make that commitment, be a part of that. Uh, often people will self-select. It becomes clear they, they, they don't want to do that. We're going to professionalize the business. We're going to put in a new management information system. Uh, odds are, if it doesn't have one today, and many of the businesses we invest in don't. Any of you have put in an, an MIS system, no, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, so we need to know that we have folks that are committed to, 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 to doing these things. And, and again, it's, uh, I, I hope it's, um, it's not zero sum. I, we're not just saying uh, work your, aff, your ass off and we'll make a bunch of money. We're saying we're going to align the interests. You're going to invest a little bit. You're going to get stock options. And when, when we're successful, we're all going to share in the success and we're going to celebrate that success. Um, in terms of, of uh, improving it along the way, uh, we do a lot of training. Uh, we have something called Riverside University. Its flagship program is the Riverside Leadership Summit, uh, which provides uh, hard skills training as well as team building and, and um, uh, strategic planning, uh, a, a regular program of webinars and the like. Uh, and then finally, uh, almost always, even at our best companies, we're um, uh, typically adding to the management team. It's very rare that the companies we invest in have what I would describe as a chief revenue officer. Odds are during our period of ownership, we're going to invest in somebody who can then take a look at how it handles its pricing, sales force composition and compensation. We're going to make um, real fundamental, important improvements in these areas using what we call the Riverside Toolkit, which is a proven way of, of achieving that. Um, so, so uh, odds are when we go to sell the business, there's going to be two or three new faces on that management team. So one last question. One last thought maybe you'd like to leave with some of your middle market colleagues in the room before we 
take off for the week? Yeah, for, the, you know, for those of you who have, have started businesses, have grown businesses, um, I celebrate you. I, you make the world go round. Uh, you know, private equity gets a lot of attention, maybe because it's perceived as being a little bit uh, sexy or romantic. Uh, maybe not romantic, but... Um, Mysterious. Mis yeah. Uh, but, but, but really, the, ha the hard work of creating businesses, starting businesses, driving businesses is, is done by you. At Riverside, we understand that, we respect that. Uh, our job is to help you achieve your objectives. And don't, uh, don't, don't uh, put us in a box, don't put us in a corner. Uh, think of us as a source of capital that can help you achieve a wide variety of objectives, uh, whether it's, it's with me or with um, uh, Cheryl or, or Matt on the origination team or Jason or Graham at Riverside, any of us here today or any time. Uh, if you have an idea for your company, for a company that you work closely with, uh, if, you're, if you're an advisor, a, a banker, uh, a lawyer, or in any role, please think of us more broadly uh, as a provider of capital, intellectual and financial, to help these companies achieve their objectives. Thank you.